One who aspires to union with God must know that all the existing religious sects revere one and the same reality. A Hindu prayer says, They call you by so many names, they divide you by different names. Yet in each of these you manifest your omnipotence. You reach the worshiper through any of them. God has infinite aspects and expressions. He may reveal himself to his devotee as personal or impersonal, with or without form. Therefore, the aspirant must never criticize any one of the many religious paths and practices that lead to God. But this does not mean that he can follow one divine ideal today and another tomorrow. The tender plant of spirituality must be protected until it grows into a sturdy tree. In order that the mind may become absorbed in God, the follower of bhakti yoga practices, devotion, and that is done to a single ideal. When love for his chosen ideal illumines his heart, the devotee will realize that it is his ideal whom others worship under different names and forms and then he will love God in all his aspects. Many followers of the path of devotion choose a divine incarnation as their ideal, whom they adore as one with the indwelling self and the transcendent reality. To quote Swami Vivekananda, perfect men are instinctively worshiped as God in every country they are the most perfect manifestations of the eternal self. That is why men worship incarnations such as Christ or Buddha. It is true that you and I and the poorest of us, the meanest even, embody that God, even reflect that God. The vibration of light is everywhere, omnipresent. But the omnipresent God of the universe cannot be seen until he is reflected by these giant lamps of the earth, the sages and saints and prophets, the God-men, the incarnations. Our scriptures say, these great children of light who manifest the light themselves, who are light themselves, they being worshipped, become as it were, one with us, and we become one with them. Thus the great prophets and sons of God being worshipped lead mankind to freedom and perfection. They are always aware that this is their mission, and they proclaim it to all. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. While Sri Krishna says, lay down all duties in me, your refuge. Fear no longer, for I will save you from sin and from bondage. While the great saint Sri Ramakrishna said, I am the sanctuary. Give me the power of attorney. I will release you from all bonds of karma. To take refuge in such a teacher is to take refuge in God, which means that we must center our life in him. God's grace is already upon us, but in order that we may feel his grace, the heart must be purified. And in order that the heart may be purified, we must practice spiritual disciplines. First, wherever the unruly senses and mind wander, we must try to see the Lord. We read in one of the Vedanta scriptures, by gathering pure food, the heart is purified. Food here means whatever impressions are received through the five senses. The secret of this spiritual discipline then is to cover everything with the presence of God. Secondly, we are to practice the ethical virtues taught in the scriptures, virtues such as compassion, nonviolence, and chastity. 
Finally, we must set aside regular hours for exclusive practice of prayer and worship. Worship means holding the chosen ideal of the Godhead before you as an object of love, and in his living presence to direct your thoughts uninterruptedly toward him, like oil poured from one vessel into another for a long time. Prayer, in the words of St. Paul, is to be offered without ceasing. Through the practice of these disciplines, constant recollectiveness of God awakens in the devotee's heart. The thought of his beloved Lord is continually in his consciousness. All cravings leave him. Only one desire remains to love God and live in complete self-surrender to his will. This pure and selfless devotion is followed by absorption in God and ultimate union with him. Love, lover, and beloved become one. The effects of this supreme love are described by the sage Narada in his aphorisms <clears throat> on bhakti yoga. Obtaining which, man becomes perfect, immortal, satisfied. He desires nothing, grieves not, hates none, does not delight in sense objects, becomes intoxicated and rejoices in the bliss of his own self in oneness with God. The man who experiences this unitary consciousness enters into the kingdom of heaven and becomes perfect, even as the Father in heaven is perfect. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Here Jesus speaks of action and its reward, cause and effect, which in Vedanta is set forth as the law of karma. The law of karma states that if I do some good deed for you, I will get my reward. Whether you yourself give me that reward or not does not matter. If I do good, I shall receive good in return. If I do something bad, bad will come back to me. That is the law. St. Paul says in his epistle to the Galatians, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But in order that we may reach perfection, we must free ourselves from all attachment, from all craving for the fruits of action. We must free the mind from every kind of impression and tendency, the good as well as the bad, for the good actions also create karma. If we want to transcend karma, the Bhagavad Gita teaches we must learn to offer the fruits of our work to God. This is called Karma Yoga, the way to union with God through God-dedicated action. In Karma Yoga, the devotee's whole life becomes an unending ritual, since every action is performed not in the hope of one's personal gain or advantage, but as worship. To dedicate the fruits of one's work to God is to work with non-attachment. We must not give way to pride and vanity if the results of our work are successful and win popular praise. On the other hand, having done our best, 
We must not despair if our work has disappointing results or is harshly criticized or disregarded altogether. Many men and women will work to the best of their ability in a dedicated manner. But if their ideal is anything short of union with God, it will be almost impossible for them not to despair if they find their cause defeated and their life work brought to nothing. Only the devotee of God need never despair because he renounces the fruits of action. He has his reward already, God himself. To many people, non-attachment suggests indifference, laziness, and fatalism. But actually, non-attachment is the very opposite of indifference. It is a positive virtue born of attachment to God. In fact, the follower of karma yoga must be intensely attached to his work while he is doing it. His whole mind must be concentrated on doing it perfectly since it is to be offered as worship but he must be able to detach himself at a moment's notice. Through the practice of non-attachment and selfless service, the devotee frees himself from the wheel of cause and effect, deed and reward, and obtains the infinite. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Here Christ begins his instructions on prayer. He tells us that if we want anything less than God, we can have it. If we want a reputation for holiness, we can go out into some public place and pray where everybody can see us, and we can get our reward, no doubt about it. Public prayer receives public rewards, recognition and wealth, followers and power. But true religion is not a matter for display. It is something very sacred and therefore secret. This is why Christ warns us not to make a show of worship. Genuine purity and spirituality need no advertising. If you pray to God for his own sake, not to make him the means to some other end, but wanting him alone, the Lord alone, then never mind the world, never mind whether it blames or admires you. Go apart into a secret place and ask for God. You can be certain that he will give himself to you. He will reward you with his own presence. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, or they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of, before ye ask him. God is not deceived. He knows our needs and our innermost thoughts. He is the hearer behind the ear, the thinker behind the mind, the speaker behind the tongue. God is that pure consciousness whose reflection upon our intellect makes us conscious. He knows whether our prayers are hypocritical or vain repetitions, or they are the supplications of a sincere heart. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, When mind and speech unite in earnest prayer, that prayer is answered. Of no avail are the prayers of the man who says with his lips, These are all thine, O Lord. 
and at the same time thinks in his heart that all of them are his. Don't be a traitor to your thoughts. Pray with a sincere and simple heart, and your prayers will be heard. <laughs> 